I got a few notes. I don't really know where I'm going to put them. Maybe I'll use them, maybe I won't. We'll just go off the cuff. Thanks so much for the invitation to come down. It's really my pleasure to be here. Um, you mentioned my father tonight. Some of my early memories of my dad in the Civil War were him going on the bus trip um, for the Chicago Roundtable and coming home and I would see this circular badge down in his office in the basement. And these pictures of him and this fella Jim Brady from Kalamazoo who was an attorney and, and they would have such laughs and talk about how much fun they had on the, the different tours. And I'm sure a lot of that, you know, subliminally influenced me to where I am today. So I really want to thank you for the, and tell you what an honor it is for me to be down here and to see so many friends and uh, faces that have supported the museum in um, Frederick when I was out there or the museum in Kenosha or wherever. So this is a real treat for me to come down and um, spend some time with, with this organization and your support for what we're trying to do in Kenosha and what we are doing is um, always appreciated. So when you come up or you're bringing guests or whatever, please stop by the front desk and say, hey, is Doug around? I'd be happy to come down. I always get phone calls say, someone's here to see you. And if they don't have an appointment, my answer is always, well, are they smiling or not? <laughs> and, and if they're not, I'll send somebody else. But if, if you say it's a friendly visit, um, I'll be sure to come. A couple things about tonight. Um, I, pasta night, we've all carbo-loaded, right? We're ready for um, running a marathon tomorrow, whatever. And I wore a white shirt. And uh, I feel like I didn't get pasta sauce all over it, so my wife would be proud. That's number one. Um, the other thing about tonight is my daughter, I got off work at, a, at noon today. I came home and spent some time with our kids. I have an eight-year-old daughter and an 11-year-old son. And my daughter and I we were riding our bikes around the block tonight, and she said, well, Dad, are you going to be around tonight? I said, no, I gotta, I'm going down to Chicago. I'm doing a program. She said, well, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm telling stories uh, to a group, a Civil War group down in Chicago, and they're going to listen. And she looked at me, and she said, but you're not that interesting. <laughs> and, and I was like, well, thank you, Charlotte. That's a huge vote of confidence um, moving forward in, <laughs> into tonight. Um, she's, she's a hoot. She's hilarious. Um, a, a bit of housekeeping. I, I tried to put a, a number of brochures out on the front table of things that are going on. This is our summer program schedule for the, the programs and talks and what's going on in, in Frederick or Frederick, in Kenosha. Uh, we do a monthly um, second Friday lecture series, which always falls in the afternoon of your meeting. So and it, it's year round, it's 12 months out of the year. We've had people in the crowd that have come up and done programs for us. So please consider coming up and joining us for one of those. And then of special merit and special mention, because I am in Chicago, I wanted to mention that next Sunday, Bill Curtis will be at the museum. Uh, Bill is doing a program. We have a new exhibit that opens tomorrow from the National Endowment of the Humanities that looks at the visual representation of the civil rights movement, how it was covered in the media, um, how African Americans were portrayed in movies and in popular culture leading up to and during the uh, civil rights movement. And I asked Bill to come because he covered a lot of this as a journalist. So his speech next Sunday will include clips of him covering the, the Dr. King's speech in uh, Washington, D.C., the March on Selma, uh, things going on locally in Chicago. So it's a free program. It starts at 1 o'clock next Sunday. So I invite you all to come up and um, have an audience with Bill Curtis. So uh, he's a great friend of the museums, and um, we hope that you can make it up for that. So you'll see that in here, as well as on, on any number of things um, going on. And I'll just the last piece of housekeeping, then we'll get going. Uh, this year, we, those of you, uh, some of you have been up to, to our annual symposium in September. We're doing it again this year. I think the date is like September 14th or 15th. It's somewhere in that neighborhood. And this year, the four speakers will concentrate on Gettysburg. So um, be that as it may, I hope you can join us for that uh, in, in mid-September. It's always a fun day, uh, and speakers come in from all over the country for that. So uh, lots of fun. So uh, let's move on with the program and what we all came to hear tonight. Uh, Elmer Ellsworth in the United States Zoo of Cadets. Let's have a conversation about this guy about Ellsworth. I think he's an interesting cat. Um, personally, for me, he, he, he's very interesting in that when I worked at the Air and Space Museum, my wife and I, when we were renting before we bought a house in Northern Virginia, we lived in Alexandria. And Holly worked for the city of Alexandria. And her office was right across King Street from where the Marshall House used to be. Those of you who've been out there recently know that the Marshall House, the building no longer exists, but it is a hotel on the same spot that Marshall House used to be. 
So visited, knew where the Marshall House was, knew the story of Ellsworth, had been, have any of you been to the Fort Ward Museum in Alexandria? It's a reconstructed fort, you know, the many forts that ringed Washington, D.C. during the Civil War. They reconstructed a lot of the earthworks, and it, they have a museum there, a small house museum, and they had a number of Ellsworth materials at Fort Ward. So the next time you're out there, I invite all of you to check it out. It's a great place to have a picnic, take, a, take, a, take an afternoon in Alexandria. So I knew this Ellsworth character, and I knew, okay, he was colonel of a New York regiment, and it seemed like a total East Coast, you know, story. And then I got to Kenosha, and we had this wonderful collection that had been brought to the museum by the Lake Forest, Forest Academy. And you learn so much about Ellsworth not being an East Coast story. His roots and coming of age really takes place in Chicago and in places like Rockford, Illinois, of all places, in Madison, Wisconsin. So the story went much deeper than here's a guy who um, vainly went into this hotel and took down the flag and was shot by the proprietor of said uh, hotel. You know, it's more of an upper Midwest Chicago story. And so I think it's really appropriate to tell that story here tonight. And then on a deeper level too, for me, it's like, all right, Ellsworth, I, I, how many of you have heard of Ellsworth before you walked in the room tonight? Yeah, we've all heard of this guy. Ellsworth, Maine. You got it. There's a lot of Ellsworth, Wisconsin. There's a lot of um, towns named after him. But it's like, how much influence could a man have? He never commanded a brigade, a corps, even a regiment on a battlefield. So for me, it's the, the answer and where we're kind of go with this tonight is, what's the deal with this guy? How much influence could he have had? And why does everyone kind of know who he is if he never had this battlefield command or success on what we usually judge, you know, these Civil War personalities or officers by? Where does it come from? And for me, it, it, you know, it's going to be the, um, the people that he influenced and taught throughout his career. He was a very young man when he died. He was only, what, 24 years old when he parent, when he died? Um, and I look back at myself and I was 24, I'm like, my God, I was a mess. But um, this, you know, what he accomplished. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, what is the visual way that we can represent Ellsworth's influence without that battlefield command on the American Civil War? How can I do it? And I racked my brain and then suddenly it hit me. It's like, duh, I know instantly how I'm gonna do this. The coaching staff of the 1992 Green Bay Packers. <laughs> Duh. I mean, it, I'm sure it's all readily apparent to you as to why, how this represents it, right? All right, well, let's dig a little deeper here. When we're talking about football, and I, I love football, it's probably my, the one thing that I love as much as the Civil War, is they talk about coaching trees in football, okay? So the head coach of the 1992 Green Bay Packers was this guy right here, Mike Holmgren. Packers were terrible before he got there. They ended up winning the Super Bowl a couple years later. But that's not the point. Let's look at his staff and who the other men were who learned from Holmgren who went on to have head coaching jobs in the NFL. There's some guy up here named John Gruden. You may have heard of him. He's now the head coach of the Raiders. Steve Mariucci coached the Lions and the 49ers. Andy Reid, Eagles, now he's the head coach of the Chiefs. Dick Duran, Bear head coach, right? Yeah. Um, Sherm Lewis went on. Ray Rhodes coached both the Eagles and the Packers. So this, I think, is a great tool to explain Ellsworth's influence on those men who were part of the United States Zoo of Cadets here in Chicago in 1860, and how his influence, what I'm going to try to show to us tonight, is how his influence carried on with them and some of the commands and some of the experiences that they had during the Civil War after his death. Make sense? That's what we're going to try to do. But let's try to learn a little bit more, more about this Ellsworth cat um, while we can, before we get into that. Elmer Ellsworth was born in Saratoga County, New York in 1837. Uh, parents were lower middle class. His father was a tailor who did odd jobs around town, and his mother ran a boarding house, took in people to make ends meet for the family. Ellsworth wrote of his parents, poor as we are and have been, I am thankful that I cannot recollect of an instance where my father or mother have been guilty of a mean-spirited or ungenerous action. Ellsworth's great-grandfather, George Ellsworth, had been a member of the Continental Army during the Revolutionary War. So soldiers and soldiering and drill were of natural interest to Ellsworth as he grew up. As a boy, he wanted to go to West Point. He, that's where he wanted to end up. But a boy from a lower middle class, upper New, state New York family didn't really have the political pull to get him into West Point. 
So that dream was never realized. But as he was working to support his family by selling newspapers on trains, working in grocery stores, he took it upon himself to read and learn as much about military and military drill and tactics as he possibly could. Now as Ellsworth um, matured into his teenage years, his life becomes a little harder to track. One account in a Kenosha newspaper of all places in 1917, Kenosha Evening Whatever News, Kenosha, Wisconsin, Monday, July 30th, 1917, present mirrors scenes of past. This is a newspaper article that was published, and it's a letter by a, name, a guy by the name of uh, Charles Goff writing to Frank Lyman, talking about how he knew Elmer Ellsworth when he was living in Kenosha in 1853, and they were at the same boarding house together in Kenosha. Now, my boss, Dan Joyce, went through and traced all the places that Goff mentions in this article, and they check out. They're, they're legit. But I have never found El any record of Ellsworth ever mentioning being in Kenosha. So I can't place that. There's no um, corroborating evidence for that. And the, the article talks a lot about Kenosha and a lot about Ellsworth, but then it goes on to this weird tangent towards the end of the article about how Ellsworth ended up in Muskegon, Michigan, living with an American Indian tribe, and it's quite bizarre. But um, there is that published report placing him there. And why would he have been in Kenosha at that time? Some ways it does make sense. In 1845, Kenosha established one of the first free public education systems outside of New England. In 1849, the city built an academic building dedicated to free public education. And at that year, 500 students enrolled in that school. So um, that could possibly be the evidence and impetus for Ellsworth coming. There's other stories uh, of him working with a group of engineers who were working on the Hudson River, and then in 1854 that group came to Chicago to work on things along Lake Michigan, and then he joined them. So those are some of the things I haven't been able to prove or disprove about him, and why maybe he might have been here in the area. Our first evidence of Ellsworth being in the area is this business card, and this is from that Lake Forest collection. The business, you know, think of a any business card of what you would have in your wallet today, that's the size of what we're looking at here. And it's his first entry into business here in town. Delsworth, or Devereaux, Ellsworth and Company, um, they're, they're basically a patent soliciting business. And this guy, Devereaux, um, Albert Devereaux is a very, or Arthur Devereaux is a very interesting person in his own right. His father was a citizen of considerable prominence in Massachusetts. He served as the adjutant general of the Massachusetts of, of Massachusetts and captain of the Salem Light Infantry, one of those pre-war militia companies. Um, from, the, from its beginning in 1834, Arthur followed in his father's footsteps, was captain of the same militia company in 1860 when Ellsworth brought the Zouave cadets to Boston. And then De Devereaux later served in the Civil War as captain with the 8th Massachusetts and colonel of the 19th Massachusetts. Some of you may re recognize those regiments in your battlefield travels. The business failed um, for Ellsworth and Devereaux and Ellsworth blamed it on an unnamed, unscrupulous third party. And basically he lost all his investment. The money that he, the little bit of seed money that he brought with him to Chicago was gone. And um, he was hurting financially. And that's the way it's going to be for Ellsworth all the way to his death. Never had two quarters in his pocket to scratch together, really. Um, and that was really the first time. But during this time in Chicago, we see him still engaged in the study of military affairs and drills. He always felt like, and this is a direct quote from Ellsworth, that God had made him a soldier and that any occupation not connected to the military seemed unfulfilling. He studied and mastered the two leading tactical manuals of the time, William Hardee's Rifle and Light Infantry Tactics and Winfield Scott's Infantry Tactics. Uh, Hardee's Light Infantry Tactics had been commissioned by Secretary of War Jefferson Davis in 1855, and it talked about a new American drill allowing for nimbler, faster paced battle movements. Ellsworth also trained in Chicago and became known locally as an expert fencer. He was in gymnasiums and kind of the YMCA equivalents around the city, and his interest led to a friendship and partnership with a guy by the name of Dr. Charles de Villiers, an expert French swordsman who had immigrated to America after service with the French Zouave Regiment during the Crimean, Crimean War. Uh, some of you may know about the, the French Zouaves wearing the uh, sh short coats without collars, baggy or trousers, um, in, you know, kind of patterning their dress after the Arab tribesmen from Algeria and Morocco who joined the French army in the 1830s. Um, these Zouaves were trained to load and fire on the run, 
while lying down or kneeling. They were also proficient with the use of the sword and the bayonet. So as Ellsworth and Devereux's friendship evolved, Devereux taught Ellsworth everything he knew about his, the drill that he brought with him from Europe and the Crimean War. Ellsworth even sent away for training manuals and began to form a hybrid system of what he had learned from the Americans, Scott and Hardy, with what he was learning about the French. But the problem was he had no one to teach him to teach this system to, that he was kind of this hybrid that he was working on. Well, his only outlet for this time wasn't going to be the American Army, the 16,000 man uh, American Army. So Ellsworth became involved in local militias. You know, militias kind of that time had a had a bit of a an odd, I don't know, reputation. Um, half, you know, as I describe it in the museum all the time, they're part National Guard, part local high school football team, right? Um, they would get together and they were supposed to drill and register with the Adjutant General of the State and drill four consecutive days out of the year, but a lot of people thought, well, all they're doing is drinking and getting drunk while they do that. And so that really, they're not protecting anybody. The, the, their hardest decision all year is what kind of uniform they're going to have and who's going to lead the 4th of July parade. You know, they're going to fight about that. And that's, you know, so they didn't have a real high, uh, you know, the American public did not have a huge high opinion of them. But I think it's interesting to look at the state of Wisconsin in 1860 and look at the numbers and what was involved in these militia companies. In 1860, it's estimated that there were 1,993 militia members in Wisconsin serving in 52 separate companies. The federal government supplied the state of Wisconsin with 80 rifled muskets, 80 sets of infantry accoutrements, 40 sets of infantry accoutrements from old pattern muskets, 12 artillery swords and belts, 50 holsters, 40 percussion rifles, and 12 non-commissioned officers' swords and belts. These arms were given to the commander of the chief in chief of the state militia, who was the governor of the state, and the governor distributed them to the individual militia companies. The governor had the power to disband any militia company and have them turn in their arms if he wasn't happy with what they were doing. And individual militia companies had to make yearly reports to the adjutant general's office, have an armory to house their weapons, and train for four consecutive days, as we already talked about. If the company, militia company, ceased to exist, the arms provided to them would be returned to the state armory and redistributed. Officers captain and below were elected by the militia company. Officers major and above were commissioned by the governor. Okay. So that's a little bit about those militias and what Ellsworth is entering into at this time. So we mentioned Ellsworth and Rockford. He doesn't have a command of his own, but in December of 1857, a General R.K. Swift got wind of what Ellsworth was doing here in Chicago and invited him to a militia banquet held at Rockford, Illinois' Hoffman House. The dinner was for the leading militia leaders of Illinois. At that dinner, the captain of the local Rockford Militia Company the Rockford City Grays, uh, came, into El came up to Ellsworth and offered him command and as drill master of his group the following summer, so summer of 1858. Ellsworth accepted, came to Rockford that summer, and the company was put through their paces, and their goal was this four-day encampment that was going to take place at Camp Sinisippi in Rockford. Have any of you, a nine, and you're going down 90, you go from Wisconsin into Illinois, um, there's a Sinisippi Park even in Rockford today, and I'm imagining that's probably where this was. There were other um, militia companies there. The National Guard cadets of Chicago were, were in attendance, and the Washington Continental Armory of Elgin were also that, at that encampment. And on the fourth day, Ellsworth and the Rockford City Grays debuted this new system that he had been working on, this freedom of movement, um, moving around, loading and firing, doing all these different maneuvers and movement that we'll get into and we'll see visually exactly what they were up to at that time. So in Rockford, Illinois, of all places, is where he debuts this system. That Christmas, um, later in 1858, Ellsworth moved to Madison, Wisconsin. He was offered um, an appointment to train a militia company in Madison known as the Governor's Guard. And the Governor's Guard was made up of the leading men of Madison, Madison society. Judges, lawyers, bankers, businessmen. The same people I'm looking at right now in for me. <laughs> the leading citizens of Chicago. Some of these members of the Governor's Guard went on to serve as officers in Iron Brigade regiments. So let's talk about it. Does anybody recognize either of the two individuals that are displayed on the screen? Quiz time. Call it out. Who are these men? Anybody know who the guy on the right is? 
If you've ever read anything about Gettysburg, he wrote one of the best first-hand accounts that's still studied today. Frank Haskell. Yeah, Frank Haskell, the adjutant of the 6th Wisconsin, is on our right. And the dude on the left, uh, he has both his arms at that time, but that's Lucius Fairchild. Both of those men were members of the uh, governor's guard. So even Ellsworth has influences, and if any of you read Lance Hertigan's books, his most recent one, he talks about Ellsworth even influencing in some small way the Iron Brigade itself and the, and the early training of the Iron Brigade because of what he did, was doing in Madison with these two individuals. So there we go. We see some of the seeds of, of Ellsworth's tentacles and influence. Ellsworth moved back to Chicago in 1859 and began a clerkship at a law office. The first step of his hope to becoming a lawyer. And that seems kind of odd. You know, here's a guy who he just said he, he's, a, he's born to be a soldier. Now all of a sudden he's clerking in a law firm. Wonder, why did that happen? What, what might have happened? Well, he met a girl. Um, Ellsworth met a, a girl, 16-year-old girl by the name of Carrie Spafford in Rockford. They came to some engagement or, ag or agreement. Now, Kerry Spafford's father was a leading banker in um, Rockford, and everybody loved Elmer Ellsworth. He was very charismatic, and I, I have, you know, not too many people say bad words about him, and I'm sure Kerry's father loved him, but the fact that, how was he going to support her, you know? So he encouraged Ellsworth to set aside all things militia, and why don't you go get a real job, you know? <laughs> Become a clerk in a law firm in, in Chicago, and put aside this militia training. That's, there's no future in that, right? Um, there is a future in the law. So Ellsworth started to do that, but he had militia uh, feelings tugging at him. In April of 1859, an, an invitation for some friends changed everything in the course of Ellsworth's life. Remember those National Guard cadets who were in Rockford with him? They were looking for a new drill master at that time, 1859. The group was uh, in dire straits, losing membership, approaching bankruptcy, in danger of disbanding and returning their weapons to the state armory in Springfield. In desperate straits, they turned to Ellsworth and offered him command of their militia company. And this is a quote from one of their members. We were a military company of the old school, continental uniforms, broad cross belts, bare skin hats, ponderous, heavy and slow. We drilled according to Scott and learned all there was in the tactics. Having nothing to learn, nothing to learn or new to learn, the interest of the members died out. Our debts increased, and we went into bankruptcy in April of 1859. That's what Ellsworth's entering into. Despite his father-in-law's wishes, Ellsworth saw this as an opportunity to mold this group into what he envisioned for as a, what an American militia company should be and could be, both militarily and morally. We're going to come to find that Ellsworth's influence has more to do with just, hey, we're going to march in, in, in left, right, left, right, and this is what we're going to do. So he is going to take a great interest in their moral behavior as well. And here's a, here's a quote from Ellsworth when he took command of the Zouab cadets. I told the cadets that they wanted a company of soldiers in every sense of the word and were anxious to make that company a source of improvement morally as well as physically, then I would command them, and in commanding them would enforce the strictest discipline. He started by making membership in the group an outlet for physical exercise. Their armory became a place where young men could learn the science of military tactics and, some, and improve themselves physically. How did he do that? He removed all the distractions and objections usually leveled against the American militia companies. He placed restrictions on members in regards to drinking, gambling, foul language. <laughs> Couldn't go to a billiards hall anymore. Ellsworth already had nothing against the game, but he said it was kind of like a gateway into other bad things. And you were not allowed to go to houses of ill fame anymore. Mm. He created a reading room and other less morally objectionable activities for the members to engage in. So there you see some of his guidelines for the USZC, or uh, the National Guard cadets as they were formerly known. Other things from the collection that's, that are evidence of um, this effort. Cadets Gymnasium, good until July 1860. It's kind of like a Y card, right? Gets you into the into the more into the um, armory. You can come hang out with the uh, with the cadets. Cadets Terpsichorean Club managers: Colonel E. E. Ellsworth, President. Other list. Terpsichorean is like a dance club. So there's the dance club there. So he's efforting all of these things to um, improve their moral standing. They also kind of had a, a thing where if one member lost his position, 
it was incumbent on the others to help this person financially until they found a new job. So it became a real fraternity as well uh, for the men. The men of the company took to the new discipline and training and the results were pretty immediate. The first public appearance of the newly named United States Zoo of Cadets was the annual Chicago 4th of July parade. The company was to parade in front of the entire city as well as the mayor and city council, then present a public demonstration of their new drill outside the Tremont House. It was a grand success, and Ellsworth wrote to Carrie Spafford, quote, the glorious 4th is past. The enclosed articles cut from the Chicago newspapers will show you the result of the cadets' drill. It was a grand triumph, I assure you. One continual round of applause and cheering from the time we commenced the drill until we ceased. The next great triumph for the Zouave cadets occurred on September 15, 1859. The United States Agricultural Society was hosting a fair in Chicago with an open militia company competition on the grounds. The winner of the competition would be crowned national champion and receive a standard of colors worth $500. It's kind of like, again, going back to my love of football, these guys were going to be the BCS national champions, right? They have a, a, a committee that was going to vote on this. We won't have a real tournament, but they're national champions when all this is said and done. The Zouav cadets drilled uh, before the competition. They beat one other militia company that showed up to drill against them, and they won the prize. Now, not surprisingly, other militia companies from around the country took a little offense to the Zouav cadets claiming to be national champions. Well, you, you beat one other company. I mean, come on, guys. And you're from the West, you know, out there in Chicago. We're here in New York and in Boston and other more, more well-established places. Please, you know, slow your roll a little bit, guys, when you're talking about being national champs. And so what Ellsworth did in response to that was he published in the newspaper an open challenge. Come to Chicago and drill against us in a fair competition. And if you beat us, we will give you the standard of colors that you can see there in the background of that picture. But no one took them up on their offer. But that was okay, because Ellsworth had a different plan and a different view in mind. If they won't come to us, we'll go see them. He was, his plans were to organize a 20-city tour, leaving from Chicago in 18, summer of 1860, and go out and drill against these militia companies of the Northeast and Pennsylvania, Ohio, St. Louis, and then come back to Chicago. So this is the big summer tour that he's planning. Now remember, Ellsworth has no money. He has to fundraise for all this. He's training the men. He's there booking it, you know, putting together a tour. He's got to secure rail travel for these men. He's got a lot on his plate. So he's doing all of this to arrange for this tour um, in the summer of 1860. It takes off and leaves from Chicago in July, July 2nd. And the men had trained before then a full six months before they were to leave. Um, having decided to make the tour, this is another quote from one of the men, the men gave up everything except business and the company. All visits to theaters, calls on friends, parties, etc., must be sacrificed. Every evening except Sundays would be devoted to drill from 7 to 11. A vote of the men sustained the views. All the military exercises were performed wearing 23-pound knapsacks. Part of the athletic portion of the drill used horizontal bars, ladders, and other gymnastic equipment. Many of those not willing to endure the discipline and rigors of the training dropped out. So that's what they're up to, you know, training for this, this, uh, this tour. The tour is, is kind of delayed a little bit. Ellsworth had a younger brother, Charlie, who came from Mechanicsville, New York, and moved to New York, or moved to Chicago to train with him. And Charlie died of disease that July. So Ellsworth accompanied his body back to New York State, buried his brother, and then returned, and then the tour got underway. So a personal tragedy um, hit, but the, the show must go on. The first stop, July 2nd, 1860, uh, was in Adrian, Michigan. Anybody ever been to Adrian, Michigan before? I have. At Kalamazoo, we used to play them every year in football. Adrian College, the Bulldogs, I hated those guys. <laughs> Cheap shot artists. Of course, anybody who was in present company excluded. Uh, Adrian, Michigan was the first stop. Detroit was number two. Uh, this was what accompanied the men, the 50 men who went on the tour. A band of 15 pieces to what accompanied the U.S. Zouav cadets, known as the Light Guard Band. A total of 50 Zouavs with the average age of 22, 
would bear the sacrifices and training and go along. Each man would bring with him three uniforms, one full dress of buff and blue, one chasse de, I can't say this, Vincennes uniform of the blue and red, and one of the brilliant loose Zouave drill uniforms. Ellsworth also made it clear that the pledge of um, temperance and good behavior would, would continue on the tour, and he said, this is a quote, by the eternal, the first man who violates his pledge shall be stripped of his uniform and sent back to Chicago in disgrace. So help me God. He only sent back one guy from Detroit. Um, was sent back. So they're on the tour and they're visiting all these places. They go from Detroit through Cleveland into upstate New York, Utica, Rochester, and end up in New York and in Boston. They go to West Point. They go down to Washington, D.C. Then on their way back, they stop in Pittsburgh, uh, Cincinnati, St. Louis, Springfield, Illinois, and back to Chicago. So let's take a look at what some of the things were, they were doing because we have an awesome visual record of this because Ellsworth became, the, the quote is, he became the most talked about man in America. The newspapers followed these young men wherever they went. And so there's a great visual record of some of these drills, particularly when they were in New York. So what were they doing? What were the eyewitnesses accounts of some of the things they did that made this so appealing to everyone? The group came running to the drill in squads of four. So athletic movement, rapid, quick orders, executed accurately and promptly, properly timed by the cadets with rapid movements and symmetry of motion. The men fired at will, fired by file, fired by platoon, fired all together. The men stacked arms, made human ladders, and pyramids. They marched and formed different shapes, crosses, parallelograms, circles. They did a fire and advance drill. The front line fired, opened ranks, the rear guard charged forward with bayonets, faced open lines, fired, repeated. They parried and thrust with drills with fencing and bayonets, swords. Uh, they loaded and fired while lying on their backs. They did something called the tap drill, exercises of the manual of drill done to the tap of the drum instead of verbal commands. And then the final, you know, big grand finale was an all-out all out charge by the 50-man uh, company. So this is, remember, this is the, before the days of cell phones, TV, and every, so it wasn't uncommon for 5, 10, 15,000 people to come out and view these young men, and particularly the ladies of those communities, to come out and view what was going on. So here's some other great images um, published in... Um, one of the, the uh, pictorials, 1860, the men going through their paces. You can see our bayonet drill on top here, down below the squads of four, uh, wearing the Zouave uniform. There's that um, the squad where they would load and fire, the, the rear would come up in front. All kinds of great stuff. Very visually pleasing, very exciting. July 26, 1860, the group ended up at West Point and drilled in front of the Commandant of Cadets, William Hardy, and the highest ranking general of the United States Army, Winfield Scott, the two who, men who literally wrote the books by which they were studying. I mean, could you imagine? These are not professionally trained soldiers. These are just kids, guys who were doing this on the side. And they were, it was written by both of these men that they were very impressed by what they saw and what they, um, they did. August 4th, 1860, the group traveled to the White House for President Buchanan. And there's a long quote from President Buchanan um, praising what the Zouab cadets were doing and um, how dedicated they were. And as I said before, from Washington, the men they made their return to the Midwest via Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, St. Louis, and Springfield, where a prairie lawyer by the name of Abraham Lincoln was to, said to have seen the drill in Springfield um, from the underneath of a shade tree in, in, in Springfield. So he was aware of Ellsworth and what was going on. The group returned to Chicago triumphantly. Uh, later on in August, the mayor met them. And this was the quote from the mayor of Chicago. You have demonstrated what a citizen soldierly is, soldiery is capable of becoming, and that no large standing army is necessary to repel invasions or suppress insurrections. Well, that's going to prove to be untrue in about a year and a half, right? Over 10,000 people remained at the wigwam here in Chicago to welcome them back 
and have a big grand party to welcome back their local heroes, Elmer Ellsworth and the Zouave cadets. Ellsworth, after that, the, the group had one more drill, and then it kind of disbanded. I, I don't think you could keep up that effort of training for long. Six months is maximum effort. Any group dynamic like that, I, I think it would be hard to keep up, the, the energy behind it. Ellsworth traveled south. Lincoln invited him to clerk in his law office. And oh, by the way, there's this presidential election coming up in 1860. And we have evidence from local uh, central Illinois papers. My friend Mark Johnson, who works for the State Archives in, in Springfield, sent me newspaper articles of Ellsworth going out and campaigning for Lincoln in some of those battleground communities around Bloomington, Illinois, and central Illinois. Because remember, Lincoln carried the northern Illinois state, the counties of, of northern Illinois. Douglas was the southern counties. And then the battleground would have been those central Illinois counties of the, for the election of 1860. So Lincoln was no dummy. He sent Ellsworth out to campaign, trying to capitalize on some of his, um, his popularity. When Lincoln was elected, Ellsworth accompanied Lincoln to Washington, D.C. as personal bodyguard. Um, and was, uh, Lincoln got a government job for him and secured the job for him early, um, early on. Uh, when the war broke out, Ellsworth resigned that commission, and he traveled north to raise the 11th New York. Now he raised those men, if you're trying to raise the biggest, baddest, toughest, roughest regiment that you can at that time, where are you going to go in New York City? Well, Ellsworth went to the firehouses. He went to the fire companies of New York. And so that's where the men came from to make up um, the 11th New York. Now, let's talk about the tour of itself. What was, why was the tour so successful? Why did it capture the imagination? I think for three reasons. The Zouav system combined the great appeal of the precision of military drill with spectacular physical elements calculated to capture the imagination of the public. It was fun to watch. It was entertaining, colorful. The fact that they also stayed true to their original pledge of moral discipline and temperance, as far as the consumption of alcohol and liquor went, brought honor to the tour and renewed as uh, respect for the militia companies all over the country. And then you can't deny the force of Ellsworth's personality. Lincoln called him the greatest little man he'd ever met. He was only about five foot three, five foot four, short man. But he had charisma, leadership, enthusiasm, knowledge. He had presence, right? I mean, I think we've all been part of a, either a team or a business or just any organization where someone kind of is just elevated and you, you follow them. But what about the military value of the tour? Was there any? Well, in the wake of the tour stops, many new Zouab style militia units sprang up after the visit in Albany, Salem, Massachusetts, Utica, all of those militia companies that came out to welcome the crew as they came into town, let them stay at their armory. After they saw what Ellsworth had done, they wanted to train like the Zouaves. So they became Zouave militia companies. And then of the, the 50 men that went on the tour with Ellsworth, 47 of them went on to serve in some capacity with the Union Army. Two served with the Confederacy. Many of the men took the training that Ellsworth bestowed on them and became leaders amongst the regiments in their own Union Army uh, companies or regiments. Therefore, the training and discipline that Ellsworth instilled in the United States Zouab cadets lived on beyond their own organization and infiltrated other regiments from the Union states, other Union states. Now, how are we doing on time? I have a, f I have a few examples of some of these men that we can go through and talk about if you'd like me to carry on. If you want to get the hook and go and, yeah. okay, we'll carry on. Okay, so we all know the story of Ellsworth commanding the 11th New York. They were on the Maryland side of the river. Then on May 23rd, 1861, the 11th New York was sent to Alexandria, Virginia. They, they got off a, a transport boat out of the Potomac River down at where, how many of you have been to Alexandria before? Kind of where King Street comes to an end there and the, the Potomac River. Great restaurant down there called Chadwick's. My wife and I had our first date there. It's a great place to go. Um, next time you're out there, go to Chadwick's. Not too far from where the Marshall House used to be. They were to secure the railroad station in Alexandria and cut the telegraph line. That was their mission. Ellsworth ended up taking a squad of six men into the Marshall House because of that um, Confederate banner, not the, the battle flag, but the first national flag. He brought it down. You know, people will tell you that Lincoln could see that flag from the White House. And it was such an affront that that's why Ellsworth did it. 
And you know, Mary Lincoln was just appalled by seeing this flag. One time we were in Alexandria on the 4th of July. I know I can lie to you, we were having a few. And the 4th of July fireworks were going off over at the mall. And I struggled to see the fireworks from where we were on King Street. So to say that Lincoln could see that flag from the White House, I think is a bit of a stretch. I think it was a bit of a justification for why Ellsworth did it kind of after the fact. He's a 24 year old guy. He's the most talked about man in America. And no goddamn flag is gonna stop me from going up there on that. You know, Ellsworth wouldn't have sworn, he wore swore off. I, I, sorry, Elmer. Um, he would have, though, yeah, that, that flag's coming down. Cause I'm Elzer, Elmer Ellsworth. And, I'm, and it's coming down. So we all know the story. He was shot by the proprietor, Mr. Jackson, who was in turn shot by Francis Brownell, Company A of the 11th New York. There's Brownell in his 11th New York uniform. I believe that uniform is at Manassas. If you go to the parks, the Battlefield Museum, you can see it there in the Visitor's Center. Um, picture of Brownell there. And there's the flag uh, in question. I believe Greg Biggs actually gave me this uh, photograph. It's in the, um, it's in the state museum state archives in New York and it's so torn up because everybody wanted a, a relic of it you see little snippets of it out there and so that's why it ended up you know historic preservation people today we don't save anything historic well no one saved anything historic then either and they cut the flag up so there's the story of Ellsworth you know he died his body was brought back and lying state at the White House for um, several days he's buried in Mechanicsville there's a big monument to him up in his hometown of upstate New York so great friends of Lincoln and the family. He used to go there to get his mail to the White House. Um, you can read more about that um, later on. But there was a, an affinity with, with Ellsworth and the Lincoln family. So let's talk about, let's figure out where some of these men from the Zouav cadets ended up. I don't have all 47 of them, but I've bits and pieces. Sometimes I have an image, sometimes I don't. I've been able to find a few of these guys and where they served and what they were up to during the Civil War. George Fergus was one of them, first lieutenant, Company K. Where we'll start out with the 11th New York, the men who traveled to New York with Ellsworth. They became lieutenants, and they were mad about that. They thought they should have been of higher rank, and they complained and said, well, the, all the captains of the group are these firemen, and all they know to do is how to swear. And that's why they're captains. And so they complained about that a little bit. But all the men who were with Ellsworth became lieutenants in the 11th New York. Uh, George Fergus, Robert worked together to publish the Fergus Historical Series. Maybe some of you have heard that. 40 volumes and pamphlets on early Chicago, Illinois, and the history of the Northwest. The Fergus Historical Series uh, comprised the most authoritative history of the early days of Chicago and the state. Uh, I don't know if any of you ever encountered that in your historic research, Bruce. Frank Yates, and these are all obviously post-war images. Um, there was an article that I found that the men used to get together on a yearly basis, the Ellsworth Zouab Cadets, and there was an article in one of the papers that I found that published their images. First Lieutenant, 11th New York, went on to serve with the 73rd New York, 18th New York Cavalry, moved back to Chicago, worked as a telegraph agent for the Board of Trade, and continued to teach fencing up until his death in 1922. Edward Morton Coates, First Lieutenant, you can see there he went on to U.S. Regular Cavalry, uh, had a long military career. He retired in 1900 uh, from the U.S. Army and died September 14, 1913, in Washington, D.C. Now, after Ellsworth's death, the 11th New York was at first Manassas, first bull run, uh, and they didn't perform well, and they caught a lot of flack from the press. And after that, the regiment kind of, kind of faded away. And so what you end up seeing is a lot of those 11th New York men that were Ellsworth's buddies left the 11th New York. And a lot of them ended up serving with the 44th New York, the Ellsworth's Avengers, or the People's Ellsworth Regiment, my friend Ron Coddington in Military Images had an article about the 44th, and sometimes on the caps, you see the letters P-E-R on their hats, People's Ellsworth Regiment. And the idea was to get men from all of the counties of New York to represent Ellsworth and to carry his legacy on and serve with the 44th. So it only seems natural that some of these men who were buddies of his in Chicago would travel to New York and be part of this regiment. Now, where is there a very large and very um, conspicuous monument to the 44th New York in a very well-known battlefield. Does anybody know? Little yeah, little round top. It looks like a giant castle. You can walk up on it on the second floor level of it and look down. So next time you go to, to Gettysburg, take some time, um, go early in the morning obviously when it's not as crowded, but go up there and you can see this massive um, stone castle that was built to the 44th New York. 
So a little bit about the People's Ellsworth Regiment, the 44th. Colonel Stephen Stryker, he was first lieutenant company B of the 11th, ended up becoming colonel of the 44th for a short time, resigned his commission July 4th of 1862, got back into the 18th New York Cavalry later on. Edward Knox, interesting character, Company A, 11th New York. He was with Ellsworth um, at the Marshall House. I think he was the first officer to, to see his body emerge from the hotel. Uh, you see he became Lieutenant of Company I, 44th, promoted to Captain, wounded twice, mustered out with the regiment October 11th, 1864, um, came back to Illinois and served with the Illinois National Guard. Freeman Connor, interesting guy. Born in Exeter, New Hampshire, 1836. Moved to Chicago in 1858. First Lieutenant of the 11th New York. Captain Company D, the People's Ellsworth Regiment, August of 1861. Promoted to Lieutenant Colonel of the 44th New York on September 2nd, 1862. Wounded twice during his service. Now, the next slide is pretty cool. During the Gettysburg Campaign, now the 44th New York, if they were on Little Round Top, they were brigaded with the 20th Maine. And as the 20th Maine was traveling northward to Gettysburg, Joshua Chamberlain fell out with heat stroke on the march. Who was assigned command of the 20th Maine? Freeman Connor, a guy from Chicago, during portions of the march to Gettysburg. July 2nd, 1863, the colonel of the 44th New York was elevated to brigade command. I think Strong Vincent, was he not the brigade commander, was wounded up there on Little Round Top. Colonel Rice of the 44th was elevated to brigade command. Who took over the 44th New York, July 2nd, 1863? Freeman Connor, a guy from Chicago. Isn't that cool? <laughs> Mustered out with the 44th New York, September 24th, 1864. Came back to Chicago, was a postmaster, did another bunch of jobs here, and died um, after going to a wedding in Valparaiso, Indiana, um, as an old, older fella. There's some of the officers of the 44th New York. Connor there, I believe that's Knox, one of the other guys we talked about, and some of the other Ellsworth men would be in there. One final man with a Chicago connection is Lucius Larrabee, Company B of the 44th, in charge of the 44th. They were sent down as skirmishers on July 2nd, 1863. He was mortally wounded, commanding skirmishers that day. Uh, his body and effects were brought back to Chicago and he was buried in Graceland Cemetery. Does anyone know where Graceland Cemetery is? Okay, cool. So there's your, you know, we're learning all of this Chicago history connected to the 44th New York. One final fellow there, or two more, Lieutenant William Danks, uh, 44th New York, and Lieutenant Harrison Kelly. Joseph Barkley, he was one of those men that went south. He was, he was originally from Kentucky. He joined the Confederacy. So we won't talk too much about him. <laughs> the other big place where a lot of the Ellsworth um, men from the Zouab Cadets ended up was in the, eight, the 19th Illinois. Um, 19th Illinois companies A, C, and K made up a, a bunch of the Zouab Cadets. Um, they were detailed south to go guard the Big Muddy River Bridge down to Cairo early in the war. And they were supposed to go east. They were supposed to go out to the Army of the Potomac. But there was a train accident, um, and some say it was sabotage. 105 men um, died due to that train accident. And if you go to Galena, Illinois, there's a cemetery up on top of one of the bluffs. My friend Scott Wolf took us um, out there for a tour. And if you haven't had Scott come talk about John Brown, you got to have him. He's awesome. He showed us some of the graves of men from the 19th Illinois who died in that train accident. Um, so they were diverted. They became members of the Army of the Cumberland. Uh, so some of the officers that were connected to Ellsworth that have ties to the 19th, John Conant Long, uh, he actually resigned his commission with the 19th to accept the commission in the regular army. This I have, I want to find more about this guy. So if, here's your charge, Chicago Roundtable. Find me more about John Long because what I have found is that he became a drill instructor at Camp Douglas. So again, imagine if he learned from Ellsworth. And then he was drill instructor at Camp Douglas. The influence then, that coaching tree as we move forward. Charles Shepley, Robert Rutherall, you can, you can read for yourself. A couple other guys here, James R. Hayden, company, Captain Company A. Samuel Boone, First Lieutenant, Company D. James Claiborne, we have a picture of him. He was one of the, the men who came back for those reunions. Captain Company K of the 19th. And then an interesting fellow. Remember that picture of the, the six men in front of the standard of colors? 
the man on the far right, Joseph R. Scott. I saw our friend, you have a Stones River golf shirt on tonight. He was Colonel of the 19th Illinois, mortally wounded in battle at Stones River, January 2nd, 1863. He lingered, he came back to Chicago, died of those wounds in July of 1863 back here in Chicago. So we have a cool image of Scott um, because he was lieutenant of the Zouave cadets along the trip. Hector Aiken, another great one, Beloit College, uh, corporal in the Board of Trade. He became a uh, officer with the 29th USCT, Company B, mortally wounded at the crater. Uh, so Ellsworth, again, the man moving on. Dwight Laughlin, interesting character. We have two more to go. Dwight Laughlin, if the company of the Laughlin Powder Company comes and says they want to set up a factory in your town, don't let them do it. Okay. Um, there was an explosion in 1886 at the Laughlin Rand Warehouse in the Brighton Park neighborhood of Chicago. They made a move to, to uh, Blue Island, they, and then they came north. They bought property in Kenosha County, which I, I think is kind of where you guys from Illinois all come and drop your money off in Kenosha County. At the outlets there on 94, it's near where the outlets are. And in 1911, there was a nighttime explosion at that factory that blew a 300 foot hole in the ground. Here's a man standing, you can't make it out, this picture's bad, it says hole in ground 300 feet by 150 feet from a explosion at Pleasant Prairie, Wisconsin. Powder. Yeah, powder. Here's a dude standing in it, here's the hole. The loft, the, the, that, that explosion. And then lastly, our friend Charles de Villiers, Colonel of the 11th Ohio, Remember, he was our French guy, right? Spencer taught Ellsworth everything about fencing. Captured by the Confederates July 17, 1861, lore has it that he disguised himself as a blind old Frenchman and, and secured transport on a Confederate boat. And then when he got off the boat in Norfolk, Virginia, he took off his disguise and said, congratulations, gentlemen, you've just helped a Union officer escape to Union lines. Okay, whatever. We don't know that, but in one of the books, I think it's Tarnished Eagles, I'm, I'm sure some of you have read it. It talks about the court martials of Union officers. There's a whole chapter on Charles de Villiers in that book. Um, he was charged with 13 counts of conduct on becoming an officer and a gentleman. He was like stealing things from the local populace in West in Virginia, which became West Virginia, selling cows back to the army for huge profit, insulting his officers and men, calling them all cowards in front of everybody else. Nobody liked him. So he was court-martialed and then kind of kicked out of the army. But there's a, I mean, look at the, I mean, look at, this is the guy. If, if there's ever a guy who's an expert fencer, that's him, right? So that's de Villiers, and that's the story of Ellsworth. I hope we have a new appreciation. He wasn't just the guy who went up the stairs and took the flag down. I think, you know, he didn't command on those battles, never commanded a regiment in battle, never was a corps commander, a brigade commander, or an army commander, didn't have that opportunity. But Boy, you can see his influence throughout some big time major league Union regiments throughout the rest of the war. Thanks so much for having me, it was a blast. Uh, questions about anything, I'll attempt to answer them as best to my ability. Sir? I, I can confirm for you, there is a Mississippi Park at Rockford. Yep. River, yes. Just north of downtown, on the, uh, the east side of the river, the west and east downtown of Rock. And it's uh, still a very substantial hilly park, very nicely. You can see where the drilling would take place, but it's got bluffs and trees. Yeah. Up, up terrain. My question: What is? Uh, how did? Could you elaborate a little further on Lincoln and Ellsworth? Uh, how did uh, you met him once? In yeah. Mexico, and then how he ingratiated himself with the president? Right. I think a lot of it was, you know, Lincoln was the consummate politician, right? I mean, he was, he, he was running for president. He did not campaign himself. He sat in his office. Here's the Republican. You want to know what I stand for? Read the Republican uh, platform. I don't know what more needs to be said. But he was savvy enough to know, here is this Ellsworth character. And boy, maybe he could go out and win some votes in some of these. I mean, he was not at the state capitol or in Bloomington, he was at these remote out of the way places from the articles that, that Mark found for me in the newspapers um, in central Illinois at that time. So um, 
don't really know how to say this, but there was a book that came out a couple years ago kind of insinuating that Abraham Lincoln was homosexual. And part of that, what they were, one of the chapters is all about Ellsworth and how Lincoln kind of sent his handlers out to find Ellsworth and create this friendship with him. Um, I think Ellsworth was a man of charisma and Lincoln recognized that and he saw his potential and said so he wanted to become an, an attorney and maybe he thought, well, maybe I can help this guy out and maybe he can help me out at the same time. And then after the election, uh, Ellsworth ended up, you know, he was there in Springfield th during the election and then accompanied Lincoln on, in February when he made that great speech at the back of the, uh, the train car. He was with him from that all the way across to Washington, D.C. So um, there, there's some things in that, 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 that chapter is a very interesting read and I don't want to downplay it, but um, and I don't believe it personally, but it's kind of like, oh, okay. Uh, that's where this author's coming from with, with this take on it. The author recanted that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, be that as it may, that's one of the, the theories. Jerry. Well, how did uh, Ellsworth do with the Spafford girl? Oh, they never married. Sad, <laughs> sad tale. Um, they had a, her letters are in the Illinois State Historical Library, um, so that their archive is down there. Um, we have in our collection a Bible that belonged to her. It's engraved to her on the inside. And it was a classic um, high school romance. He, Ellsworth liked to draw. And on a lot of the artifacts that we have, he doodled on like his business cards. And one of them is this envelope. And he wrote, Carrie. And he, you can imagine like when I was in high school in my Trapper Keeper, I would write, Carrie, I love her, you know. And that's <laughs> basically what he, you know. There's these interesting things. They never married. She ended up marrying another man after his death. You know, they were still, to, you know, betrothed. The, the agreement was still there at his death. But she re, she went to school, I believe, in New England, while he because he was writing to her, and um, those letters still exist in Springfield. Sir, from go ahead from the UK. Yeah. There is a plaque. Yes. And it's very pro-Confederate, um, the plaque that I have seen. When I was out there, it was the Hotel Monaco, one of these like boutique style deals. Um, I'm not sure, it was a Holiday Inn for a while. Again, it's right on, King Street runs east-west. You pick up the, the metro at the far end of King Street, you walk all the way down. The GW Parkway, it's just east of the GW Parkway by about a couple blocks. It's on the south side of King Street. My wife worked at City Hall, she um, had a job where, can, or, Alexandria had a couple of historic districts, and if you own a house in Old Town Alexandria and you want to make exterior changes, you have to get Board of Architecture Review approval. You know, no vinyl siding, no vinyl windows, that kind of stuff. So my wife would accept those applications in and say, yeah, you have a chance to get past the Board of Architecture Review, or you might want to think about this. Um, so that's where she worked. And so they have a big fountain right there, a plaza, and right across from that plaza is where the uh, Marshall House used to be. And there is that plaque on the on the east side of the, the building. Do we know anything about the Ellsworth uh, religious family background? I don't. All I know is what his, you know the, the grandfather. Uh, I have a lot of people when I was doing this program in Kenosha would come up to me and go, "Yeah, I'm a first cousin of Elmer Ellsworth." I'm like, really? Well, his younger brother died, and he he died early without kids. I mean, how is that? How, and I didn't want to. That's great. Um, cool. How long but, have you been doing this? I mean, this is amazing. <laughs> this, um, this got, Lance got me started on this, this project, because he mentioned Ellsworth, and we had these pieces in the collection, and he started peeling the onion, and I, I thought, wow, this is really neat. I want to know more about those 50 guys. Sure. Yes. Okay. Is the old town on the part of Alexander that you mentioned, is that the part that used to be part of the district? I think that's Arlington, but I don't know for sure. Alexander, Alexander if, I'm sure it was because it's the part right along the river there. Yeah, it was part of DC. Okay, it makes sense that it would have been. Um, it's all row houses, and my, in my, it's funny. Like, what's the big deal about our exterior changes and all that? Well, people go to Alexandria because they want to experience that flavor and stuff. But if you live in one of those row houses, there may be a thousand square feet. Last time I checked, there upwards of 1.3, 1.4 million. And so you've got a lot of people with a lot of money and a lot of ego living there. So my wife had a hard job. Let's just say that. <laughs> Bruce. Love the Zouave uniforms. Where did 
Tell us where to get the uniform. Yeah, the I. That I don't know where he had them tailored or where, where the, the, the material came from. I've yet to find that. I think the Chicago Historical Society has a uniform in their collection that belonged to one of the men that went on to the 19th, Indi 19th Illinois. I've yet to see it. But I, it's, I'm doing this program. I should get down and take a look at it. But they have other images of it. But I, I don't know. But Ellsworth would have been the, the driving force behind it because he writes, he talks to Carrie about, I've got to write all these letters and raise all these funds for this train trip. I can't imagine that he's not the one designing the uniform. And he has sketches in the Lake Forest collection of designing, you know, the uniform. Profiles of the baggy short, the trousers and the short coat and the many buttons down the front. So he was the one that designed them. But where he got the tailors and who put them together and where he got the material from, I've yet to be able to find. They had to raise their own funds yeah. Yeah. Because he didn't have any money. And you can imagine, like, had they lost on their tour, they would have had to come home in disgrace. And how was he going to secure the money for that? And then how was he going to secure, when he boasted about bringing people to Chicago to drill against the unit, I'm not sure how he would have financed that either. But I think he had powerful people within the city that um, liked him and believed in his charisma. And I think they were funding... You know, the kind of the silent partners. Kind of that secret six, like you hear about with um, John Brown and others. This side of the room, anybody? Jerry, we'll go back to you then. Yeah, this is uh, kind of a Hans Hague fan. Yeah. And his uh, youngest son, uh, Hans, is named Elmer Elsworth. And he was born about four months before Elmer Elsworth was killed. Yeah. So I, I've always assumed there was some relationship there. Could have been, or a man. Remember, Ellsworth is the most. I always joke with other groups. Ellsworth was the Beatles, the Stones, and Sinatra rolled into one in 1860. And everybody, I, you know, how many Wisconsin kids these days that were born in 1995 are named Brett for our Saint Brett Farr? Uh, it happens, and it happened back then too. Um, you know, and then the interesting thing about Ellsworth after his death, you see all kinds of stationery and envelopes with. Avenge Ellsworth, you know, Lady Liberty standing there, um, a military motif, and with that's kind of this propaganda to raise either troops or volunteers for the Union effort using the death of Ellsworth for that purpose. Say, I, at the Chicago History Museum, there is a very nice lithograph that's been displayed for a while, very, very big, of Elmer Ellsworth, Chicago, and, and they might have a yep. Never heard of him. No, who's that? <laughs> Who? Yes. Yeah. So if you really want to capture the crowd. <laughs> I didn't want to capture the crowd. I wanted to annoy the crowd. <laughs> My question is, how long do these uniforms last? Sorry, yeah, that's a great question. You see like the People's Ellsworth guys, that one with the Zouab pants? They incorporated portions. I mean, there you see the 44th officers. They're not in Zouab dress. But there is my first picture. There's one of the men. He's got the PER on. And you can tell he's, his pants are a little bit baggier and somewhat styled. They're not Zouab, like the Dury's big pantaloons, like the MC Hammer pants. Um, but... Um, and then the, the style of the coat here um, is Zouab based. So probably they wore this for a while and as a, you know, you're wearing the same stuff day in and day out. It's going to get ripped, torn, dirty, stinky, smelly. Um, and then they, they probably didn't have the cash to replace that. And so the federal government would give them the nine button frock or the four button sack. And that's what they wore because this stuff had worn out. One more question, Steele. Go ahead. Yeah. That I, I don't think so. The body lie in state at the White House. People came and saw it uh, after he was dead. The Lincoln family arranged for that um, in May of 1860. But um, I, don't, I don't think so. I think it was a civilian burial up in Mechanicsville, and there's a big uh, monument to him, a fairly, I would say, 30 feet tall, like, you know, winged victory, you know, something like that. So I, have any of you been there to see it near Albany? I think that's where his hometown is. Somewhere near the 
where they just ran the Belmont Stakes last week is somewhere where it kind of he's up there from that area. So, okay, thanks a lot. This was cool. <laughs>